I do appreciate everyone being here today. Now, last week, we continued our Advent series as we explored the Christmas miracle, the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth. And today, we continue on our third Advent series character as we explore Mary, the simple girl at the center of everything. And our initial scripture today is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 45, and it's on page 1588 in your pew Bible. So follow along as I read. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to a town in Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the one to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was once unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word of God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled in me. Then the angel left her, and then Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried into the town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is this child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. This event takes place in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth reminds me a little bit of New Concord, Ohio, where I grew up. It's the kind of town that you only visit if you have somebody you know who lives there. It's a place that you can only see on a Google map if you zoom way in very close. And with a church of our size, it's certainly somewhat of a miracle that both Sarah Miller and I are from New Concord. We went to the same high school, maybe a few years difference in gap, but the same town, that town of New Concord. And yet, this is the kind of town that the angel Gabriel announced the birth of the Son of God. Nazareth would not have shown up, up quickly on your Google Maps. To get to Nazareth, you had to bypass Jerusalem, the city of David, the center of all the religious things happening with the Jewish people. To get to Nazareth, you had to head straight to the part of Caesar's empire that was least desirable, and that part was Judea. Nazareth was such a backwater town that the first thing Nathaniel did when he was told about the Messiah, who would later become one of his disciples, said, Can anything good come from Nazareth? In other words, he asked, why would I be interested with in somebody who comes from a part of, of town or the part of the area that nobody respects? Now, if we could rewrite the Christmas story, I think one of the areas that we would change is where Christ was born. How can you have a hero, the Messiah, emerge from a place like Nazareth? It's sort of like the old slang term that you used to be used for New Concord, at least in my age, which was New Corn Cob. And yet, yet, Nazareth is where you find one of the opening acts of the Christmas story. What's more, Gabriel didn't choose to make an announcement to Herod's daughter or a member of the elite Jewish society, but to a poor, maybe even illiterate, seemingly unimportant Jewish peasant girl, a girl in Nazareth named Mary. And Mary was frequently used to name your girls in that day. As we celebrate the Advent season and examine some of these characters of Christmas, there is none so unlikely to be at the center of this divine story than Mary. But of course, 
Mary wasn't looking for prominence. She, like every other Jewish girl, peasant girl from Nazareth, she lived an ordinary life. In an ordinary rural town with unassuming dreams, she probably didn't have lofty dreams for her life. From all indicators, indicators, her life would not be extraordinary. Instead, she would marry humbly, give birth to numerous poor children, never travel farther than a few miles from her home, and then one day die, like thousands of others before her, a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. And yet Mary, who receives this first announcement of the Christ child and is chosen by God to bear the Son of God. This tells us something about Mary, her simple faith and willingness to say yes to God, but it tells us more about who God is, who Mary's God is. We often think that God only mightily works with those who are gifted and among the wealthy and well-connected people. But the Christmas story reminds us that God moves among those whose society is left behind. The thread of redemption is woven throughout scriptures in a way through many small towns and many unimportant lives, like this rug who's been woven together. Each strand might not mean anything, but when they're knit together, we can see that it becomes something useful something that we can use in our lives. And that's the story of Mary. Nobody knew Mary's name. She wasn't spectacular. Nobody but God, that is. And God knows your name also. And that means that God, as he came to earth, was called Emmanuel, God with us. He visits the lowly of station and the humble of heart, and he dwells in those who are broken and contrite. After 400 years of darkness, of silence, not hearing from God during those years, we finally hear a shout in the darkness. To fully understand Christmas, you must immerse yourself into Luke's narrative here. Become and look through the eyes of those first century Jewish people. This visit by Gabriel to Mary was improbable, so unexpected. The people of God were weary and oppressed. Once a mighty nation ruled by David and thriving under King Solomon was split up into two nations, often governed by kings and wicked rulers who would plunder the people and lead them astray from worshiping the true God. Now there would be sporadic times of revival or renewal. There was even time in the homeland after they were taken into captivity, where some of them came back, rebuilding the city and beginning to rebuild the walls and the temple. But never would they return to their former glory. All along, the prophets promised a time when David's kingdom would be restored, when a suffering servant king would come and rescue them and lead them into prosperity. And that's what they were waiting for. But after 400 long years, it came increasingly difficult to cling to those promises that they were so hoped for in the Messiah. And meanwhile, it seemed that the world had moved on. Alexander the Great conquered the lands and established the Greek culture and their language. Then the Romans conquered the Greeks. And while keeping the Greek culture, they instituted many of their own pagan practices. It also seemed that maybe God had moved on. The prophet stopped speaking to his people, and for 400 years it seemed as though God was silent. False claims of messiahs would come and go during this time, and even there was a spark of hope when the revolt of one of their own families, the Maccabees, revived fresh hope of renewal. But then eventually it was crushed by the Roman power. Now they were ruled by a ruthless and corrupt governor named Herod, installed by he, Caesar, and distrusted and disrespected and actually hated by the people. So when we open the New Testament and peek into Mary's story here, we find among the, her the most cynical of people about the promises of God when they're ruled by the mighty arm of Rome. Now there were divided sectarian tribes within the Jewish nation, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the loyalists who were loyal to Rome. They were jaded by corruption of Caesar's palace. And among the, even the religious establishment in the temple, 
it was rife with corruption. As you remember, Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who ran an illegal market within the temple. Yes, they believed the promises. They were holding on to hope because that's what the Jewish people did throughout all those years. But would the Messiah come in their time? Would he come to be among them? But mostly, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people had lost hope. And yet, amid that bleak midwinter, amid that dark world, the people who lost heart, suddenly, God broke in to announce the coming of the Son of God. This was Gabriel's second appearance in the Christmas narrative. Last week, we studied about Zachariah and Elizabeth. Six months earlier, he had appeared to Zachariah, the husband of Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. This was to announce another unlikely conception, a baby who would be born, John the baptizer, the last of the Old Testament prophets, and the one who would prepare the way for the Messiah to come. Gabriel's presence was significant because its only other appearance besides for Zechariah and Mary was back in the book of Daniel. Back then, Gabriel revealed God's plan for Israel's future destruction and in the coming of the anointed one. That anointed one would now reside in the womb of a young peasant girl from Nazareth. Gabriel was God's special angelic messenger, sent to initiate an eternal plan of redemption. And finally, after 400 years of darkness, of silence, a light would dawn on that servant girl on that peasant girl from Nazareth. What about the timing, though, of Christ's return? Yes, Mary was surprised, but the appearance of the angel Gabriel was not a moment too soon or a moment too late. Now, we often view the Christmas story as something that happened, and it did, but it's not a story that just happened. God visited this young teenage girl from a small town on the backside of the Roman Empire that was planned long ago, planned before the world began. As 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 tells us, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these days he has been revealed for your sake. The Apostle Paul, once a skeptic of this Christmas narrative, who has an, had an unlikely encounter with God, and he told the people of Galatia, what had happened and why it had happened. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. First, God promised Adam and Eve, after they ate that bitter fruit of disobedience, that God would rescue the human race. And it weaves its way throughout all of Scripture like this rug woven together through multiple stories, starting with Adam and Eve in the garden after their disobedience, and then the promise through Abraham, a nation would be blessed in Genesis chapter 12 and 17. Then Abraham's family would become a nation whose disobedience could not nullify God's promise that he made back in the garden. His promise to send the Messiah and to David, Israel's greatest of all kings. God spoke of an everlasting kingdom with one of David's heirs on the throne in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Then after David, when God's people were in distress, they were scattered, they were rebellious, they were disobedient, they were disillusioned. God spoke through the prophets. He spoke of a new kingdom that would dawn. A new king would come, one better than David. And the king would be birthed from a young virgin. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, then Isaiah said, Listen, you royal family of David, isn't it enough that you exhaust human patience? Must you exhaust the patience of my God as well? All right then. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, a virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
The may, world may have been asleep during those days when Gabriel came. Israel may have been unready, but on that fateful day where God visited Mary through the angel Gabriel, the eternal plan of redemption was on schedule at just the right time. In verses 31 through 33, it says, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Reflect for a moment on the rich symbolism in these words. In a moment, Mary, the daughter of David, was about to marry Joseph, a son of David, who would bear the eternal son of David in her womb. But more than that, Mary, the daughter of Eve, would bear in her womb a second Adam, who would come to reverse the curse that was ushered in on the human race and even the entire cosmos by the disobedience of that first Adam. And we, like Mary, might ask the question, how can these things be? Luke records Mary's initial response to the presence of Gabriel as being somewhat skeptical. And wouldn't you be skeptical? And that's a natural human response. God had not spoken directly to Israel verbally or through his prophets for 400 years. That's twice as long as the nation that we live in. And I imagine we would be shaken as well. But the angel's words disturbed her more than anything in verse 28. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now Mary was a young teenage girl from a small town. Now perhaps, and probably, she was devout and followed the Jewish religious practice. But she certainly didn't think herself anything worthy of this special angelic visit. But again, the angel reassured her in verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. What does the angel mean here? Now, most of us interpret this to mean that God gave Mary a special calling in the part of all redemption. And that is certainly true. He did. And yet, there's nothing necessarily special about Mary that warranted this special favor. And yet, God visited her and chose her to bear the Son of God, his Christ child. No, Mary knew, as we too know, that God's favor is not something that we earn, nor is it something that we necessarily deserve. Yet God visited Mary, and we who call ourselves Christians have been visited as well with a miraculous birth by God. So again, we don't deserve God's favor, yet, like Mary, because of the baby's life, we can be called a friend of God. Mary must have felt so powerless in this time. Mary's first words were in the form of a question. How will this be? Sometimes we're tempted to confuse Mary's inquiry with those sinful doubt that we found in Zechariah we talked about last week. But they're different. Where Zechariah legitimately doubted God's ability to have Elizabeth, his wife, who was past menopause, was very old. He says... I'm old, my wife can't bear children, how can this be? Which was different than what Mary proposed here. Mary was curious in a good way. In one sense, Mary's question was unique to her because she had that special calling to bear the Son of God. She wondered how she could ever conceive a child not having sexual relationships with Joseph or anyone else, but on another level. Mary's question is the question of the ages. Abraham, if you think back to him, wondered how God could make him a father of, the many, of many nations when he was old and Sarah, his wife, could not bear children. David wondered how God could continue his throne forever. And the prophets, while delivering the word of the Lord, likely wondered how the kingdom, God's kingdom could be both come as a suffering servant and a conquering king. How could he be both human and divine? The truth is that Mary's question to Gabriel is also our question. Things cannot be done by human means. Christmas, therefore, is not a fable, fable 
but indeed it's a miracle. And this is precisely what the angel answered Mary. Let me paraphrase it. He says, yes, Mary, this is impossible by mere human ability, but it's not impossible for the God of the impossible. Mysteriously, the Holy Spirit would overshadow Mary's womb. We don't know how this happened, exactly how it took place. But this is the same language that's often used in Scripture to indicate God's glory, his Shekinah glory, that glory that led the nation of Israel throughout the wilderness for those 40-plus years. God was shrouded in himself in a mystery back then. He could only be mediated through temples and tabernacles, but now he would visit his own people in the flesh. The incarnation is a work of God. And while Mary only was privileged to carry the Son of God, those of us who have placed our trust and our faith in God have that same indwelling Holy Spirit within us. The same type of miracle that God overshadowed Mary with during that time. It's just as improbable as Mary, a virgin, being found with child. How shall this be? We should ask ourselves and wonder. How is it that the Holy God can offer us salvation to those of us who don't measure up to his standard of holiness? In parts of scripture, it calls us wretched sinners. How can this new life be birthed from what was once dead? As we're dead in Christ and raised to new life in him. Today's people are scratching and clawing for favor with God. They're looking for it in politics and power and medication or alcohol. They're even looking for it through self-improvement and even in religion. But this kind of work cannot be done by human effort because it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The only way to salvation is that the Spirit overshadowed Mary and that same Spirit now indwells us by faith. It's birthing us to new life. New life in God's creation people. But we have to sit and wonder, to ponder, what was Mary saying yes to here? The angel's words, Mary had a simple response to. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May your words be fulfilled in me. In other words, Mary was saying yes to God. And this was no simple yes. Let's consider what Mary was signing up for when she was so willing to become God's servant here. Mary was saying yes to bearing the shame of an unwed pregnancy at a time with this type carried an incredible social stigma. She would be outcast by her own people. Would her friends and family believe her claims that she was visited by the Holy Spirit? Would Joseph stay with her or put her away? Now, we know the end of the story, Mary's story here. But when that angel stood before her and she was saying, yes, Lord, she had no clue how the people around her would act or how her betrothed Joseph would act. Mary was saying yes to raising the Son of God. Now, it's hard enough to raise fallen children, believe you me. But imagine the burden of raising Jesus. Imagine the fear whenever he caught a cold or some sort of childhood illness, when he left home to play with his friends and didn't come home when he thought she, he should. When they got three days journey into the desert going back home after visiting Jerusalem and realized, or a day's journey, I'm sorry, a day's journey into the wilderness and realized, where's Jesus? They ran back in panic to Jerusalem, only to find him sitting in the temple, instructing the rabbis. Think of the fear that must have gripped her heart when she realized that she was not there. He was not there with them. Or maybe when he picked up sharp tools from Joseph's carpentry shop, and she was afraid that he might harm himself. Now, God would ensure that Jesus would only die according to plan, but for Mary, the responsible the responsibility of caring for that unique, essential child must have been staggering on her. 
Mary was saying yes to a lifetime of roller coaster emotions. She would see him feed the 5,000 in the multitudes. She would see him raise people from the dead. She heard about him walking on the water. But she also saw him mocked and jeered and taunted, even at times by his family and hometown friends. Mary would have hold him, held him close during his childhood, only to have let him go. Mary would have nursed him and fed him and clothed him and rocked him to sleep. Then she'd see him being pushed away into manhood, even being rebuked by him at the wedding in Cana. And most of all, though, Mary knew what was coming. She may not have understood all that was going to happen at Calvary and all that would bring, but she knew enough to dread the day that her son would be unjustly put on trial by his people, her people. She knew enough to feel that foreboding sense because it was prophesied by Simeon just a few days after his birth of what he would go through. He'd be beaten senseless, hung on a tree, nails in his hand, a sword in his side. Every parent's nightmare is to see their children suffer and Mary would live to see this most acutely and most agonizing in any way possible. So this was Mary saying yes to, yes to God. And yet she did say yes. She said, yes, I will do it, Lord. Now Mary may have trembled as she uttered those words in, before Gabriel, and yet she didn't have a choice when you really think about it. She gave the same answer that all of us as believers give when we're visited by God. If this is true, if the baby in Mary's womb was a Messiah who would save the, her and indeed save all the world who put their trust in him from their sins, she had no choice but to say yes. And today the same question is being asked of all people, like you and like me. What will you say to Jesus? Will you say yes? Will you, like Mary, turn your back on your own dreams and say yes to the one who died for you. Mary could only say yes, because one day her son would say yes to God. Some 30 years later, Mary could say yes to this hard call of discipleship because Jesus said yes to the cup of wrath in the Garden of Gethsemane. And our yes is made possible because Jesus said yes to his father. God would sustain Mary from a humble teenage girl in a backwater town in the middle of nowhere to become the mother of the Messiah. And not only that, to become a pillar in the early church after Christ's resurrection. And that day where Gabriel visited her, she was so filled with awe and wonder that a song exploded from her. Mary's first response to the news of the angel was a simple yes. Whatever you want, Lord. But after visiting her older cousin Elizabeth and sharing the news, perhaps she shared the news with Elizabeth as the very first person, maybe even before Joseph, we don't know. Whether she told Joseph first, because it says she hurried off to visit her cousin Elizabeth. But seeing her godly mentor's confirmation of her calling, then Mary penned this song, it's a beautiful hymn that God's people have sung for over 2,000 years. It's called the Magnificat, and I put this on your bulletin insert, Mary's Song of Praise. And it's not a simple sentimental Christmas poem. It reads like a song of revolution in Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 53. So follow along as I read it. Mary's Song. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of a humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel 
remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Then the last verse in that section is, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. More than likely, Mary stayed until after the birth of John the Baptizer, seeing that special child that her cousin Mary had, or Elizabeth had, she then returned home to deal with what was going to have to deal with, to deal with Joseph, to deal with her family and friends, to deal with society who would scorn her and shame her for being pregnant out of marriage. Now, Mary didn't know everything. Mary didn't understand all the angel told her, and like every other sinner that we are, we are, Mary was prone to doubt and worry and fear. Mary didn't cling to what she knew. Mary did cling to what she knew. The child inside her, she knew, was no ordinary child, that he was that chosen one of God. But this chosen one would bring down the rulers from their thrones and scatter those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. This child would save his people, including Mary, from their sin. This child would reverse the curse of Adam and Eve. This child would rule the nations. Mary could look back on the pages of God's redemptive history, back to the promises woven throughout Scripture, like this rug is woven from the time of the garden of Adam and Eve, through the time where Abraham was chosen as God's holy nation, through all of Israel's history, she knew she was part of this tapestry, this woven picture pointing to the culmination of her son. Mary could see that in this upside-down nature of God's kingdom, that it doesn't wind its way through the princesses and palaces among the world, but through those who are humble enough to receive Jesus. Now, you may feel insignificant, as I do at times, in the middle of nowhere, or from the middle of nowhere, from places where God has seemed to abandon. But God knows your name. Now, others may reject you. You may feel unspectacular at times. But are you willing to say yes to God? Are you willing to be reborn by the King of Kings, not only at the time of our salvation, but every day saying, yes, Lord, whatever your will is for me today, to build your kingdom here on earth as you started when that Christ child came, are you willing to you be used by God every day? Mary is somewhat of a rags to riches story, and not because Jesus made her famous or wealthy, but because she, like everyone who receives Jesus, was brought from death unto life, from poverty of the soul to the riches of heaven. And that's not only Mary's journey, though, but it's the journey that every one of us who encounter God by faith, who are called a friend of God. And if you look at your bulletin insert on the other side, I provided some Advent reflections for this week. Mary, that symbol girl at the center of everything, and I'm just going to read the five questions to reflect on this week. What does God's choice of Mary tell us about God? Second, what does Mary's faith teach us about faith? Third, what does the plan of God from Genesis to Revelation tell us about the faithfulness of God? Fourth, what can we discern from this supernatural birth of Jesus? And fifth, what can we learn from Mary's yes to God? That's the story of a servant girl, a peasant girl from a nowhere town in the middle of nowhere, a town that was not looked upon favorably. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Is that our heart attitude? This Christmas season, the season of Advent, when the Jews were in this season, they were looking for that long-expected Messiah. Now we look back and look for that second Advent now as we ponder the time of this Christmas season. And that's the story of Mary. That simple girl at the center of everything. Next week, our character study will look heavenward at the songs of the angels 
And I'd ask you to please read Luke chapter 2 and specifically verses 13 and 14 in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your humble servant, Mary, who is willing to say yes to your plan for her life, willing to be obedient. Help us, Father, to be obedient as we reflect on this Advent season. Help us to be willing to say yes to whatever you have for our lives on a daily basis, Father, because we know that your kingdom is built each day by our lives, by people observing our lives and seeing that light that is now shining in the darkness until we experience that second advent. You're coming to rule and to reign forever, Father, to establish your global even. We give you thanks, Father.